getting back now to, uh, to you said you want to do a more targeted uh, imaging and biopsy, but what about uh, the specimen handling? And what's the optimal specimen handling in your, in your institution or from your recommendations from the white paper? So that was one of our, our, our uh, tasks within the white paper committee was to figure out uh, what's the optimal way for specimen handling. And this, this gets back to the fundamental problem that the way currently healthcare pays for specimen handling is that every container, every specimen we send to pathologist is billed separately to the third party payer as a separate fee. And the reason for that is the pathologist would process, fix, uh, and section each mm -hmm. specimen separately. So we looked in the literature really to say, uh, how does individual labeling help us? And the first question is, does it help us clinically? If we know that there's a cancer on a 12-core biopsy that's located in the right mid-gland as opposed to the right base, does that influence our management in a reliable way? We looked first at the ability of that data to predict the site of extracapsular extension, and we saw that it doesn't correlate very well. The laterality prediction is pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. If you have a core that is positive on the right, it's pretty re reasonable likelihood you would have ECE on the right, particularly when you combine that data with the number of cores positive and the Gleason score, et cetera. But the actual location doesn't really predict it well. With regard to surgical margin status, it's not very predictive, although apical biopsies are often associated with a higher rate of apical positive biopsies. So there are bits and pieces of the information that one would like to retain. Far lateral tissues sometimes are more informative than medial tissues. Uh, so we made the, the, the observation that there's no compelling clinical data to say that you really have to individually label each site. That's putting aside some of the emerging trends towards focal therapy right. and other forms of therapy. But in standard practice where we might prescribe standard conventional treatments for our patients or where we're going to do surveillance, right. location of cancer doesn't seem to help us much. And the reason for that is that if you or I were to do a 12-core biopsy, what we call the right base might differ greatly. Yep. So it's very subjective. And I think that contributes to a very wide disbursement of the correlative data. Now, on the other hand, the number of cores you put in the container does affect the quality of pathology processing. And the reason for that is if you put multiple cores in a jar, they often get entangled, they fragment, they tur it turns three pieces into 16 pieces, and the pathologist loses tissue. And there's a lot of literature that shows that the rate of cancer detection is lower when you put multiple cores in the jar, mm -hmm. and that the rate of equivocal diagnosis, ASAP, is higher. Uh, which would lead to more biopsies. There's nothing in the literature that tells us how many cores is too many. Mm -hmm. So we sort of came up with the conclusion that one probably should not put more than two cores in a jar because of the risk of core entanglement and, and worsening uh, 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 pathology assessment. Uh, and until there's a better study done to tell us how many is too many, we ought to limit it to that. There is an, an, a nice body of evidence in the literature that if you want to do that, and you can ink one of the cores to mark which one's in the lateral. So in other words, do a sextant, incorporate far lateral cores, ink the far lateral one so the pathologist can orient them in the prostate. So we offered a couple of suggestions. One would be to continue with 10 to 12 core uh, sampling and label each individually. I think that's acceptable from a clinical practice standpoint. I'm not sure how long insurance will continue to pay for right. that. Right. Uh, Another option would be to reduce to eight jars and to group the apical cores, right and left, to group the far lateral cores, and then to label the, the, the mid, mid ones separately. So in other words, you'd be in eight total jars in that way with no more than two cores in each jar. At our institution, we had a man that we tried to, to do the differential labeling like you were talking about, and I think we ended up sending down eight jars. The man came back with this incredible bill from pathology because each one of those jars was a separate bill. Now, how do you get around that, uh, your particular institution? What do we tell the practicing urologist about the practicality of doing that? And of course, it, it does take some time and each one of those specimen jars is going to cost something. So what do you say about that to the, to the average practicing urologist? Well, I, I have the same problem, particularly when there's a large copay attached right. to the pathology. Right. And uh, patients, will, I've seen them come back with a huge bill. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you do saturation biopsies, it's even worse. Mm -hmm. um, I think patients have to be aware of that before the biopsy. Uh, 
but I, I worry about the idea of putting it all in one jar. I think the quality of the pathology will be lower. I tell patients that there would be a higher likelihood they may need a repeat biopsy if the data is not as informative. Uh, and so I think you can strive to reduce the, the jars as much as you can. You know, you could use six jars and put two in each and ink one or, or, or mark one for laterality if it's important to you. I think some of it has to be personalized to your practice standard as well. If you're in a practice where the vast majority of your patients are treated with radiation, then I would argue it's probably not that important right. to know what's at the apex and what's at the base. Uh, and in those patients, you might opt <clears throat> simply to do right and left sampling or, or even put them all in one jar. Uh, in, if you're in a practice where you want to do radical prostatectomies on a subset of your patients, then I would argue knowing the apical cores is important, knowing the far lateral is important as it might influence your decision making about how you preserve nerves and how wide you take a margin. Uh, and if, certainly if you're in a practice where you want to employ newer techniques, focal treatments, ablative treatments, then the location of cancer becomes, I think, even a little bit more important. Surveillance is an interesting question because up until now the way we've practiced surveillance is to uh, go back and repeat sampling. And I'm not sure that when we do surveillance, our goal, you know, many people think that the goal of surveillance is to go back and hit the same area. It's really not. It's to sample the rest of the gland and rule out the possibility of higher grade disease. So I would argue in surveillance patients, location of cancer probably is not that informative. Uh, and in those patients, it may be very well worthwhile just to know the laterality. You know, that's an important issue. I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but uh, that's an important issue. You know, if you look at many of the larger databases, whether it's radical prostate, the average prostate will have three to five prostate cancers in various stages of evolution within. So I think that's a very important point is that for our active surveillance population, you hear people say all the time, well, I'm going to go back and try to hit that same spot and uh, see if we have a change in the number of cores, et cetera, et cetera. It probably is more important to say, no, I'm actually trying to map out the rest of the prostate to make sure we didn't miss something else, which we've seen at this meeting is very important. It's far more important. Uh, in fact, in a way, you've confirmed that the disease you've already hit is low risk. Mm -hmm. What you want to hit is higher risk disease right. if it's Anything present. And, and as I said before, that's often in the anterior prostate, things we miss, or in the very far lateral regions. So we've actually developed computerized templates that shift the template to different locations for second surveillance biopsies rather than trying to go back to the same areas. Great. Anything else that uh, you'd like the leadership to know about uh, imaging, about sampling, about uh, anything else that might be important for their, uh, for their practice? You know, I would, I would only conclude by saying that most of the time we, we focus on who we should biopsy. And, and we, we tend to indict uh, over, over sampling of low PSA men as the cause of overdetection. But actually the technique of biopsy has a lot to do with that as well. So once you've decided who you're going to biopsy, I think it's worthwhile to have a strategy in mind that balances all the elements we talked about. Maximizing cancer detection, avoiding repeat biopsies, and avoiding oversampling, which will identify a lot of these smaller cancers. If we can do that across the country, I think that it corrects a lot of the ills of uh, prostate cancer detection and puts us in a better position to prove that we're really helping patients. That's fantastic. Thanks for your time. Enjoy. Thank you.